And the Bible says that how good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. Psalms 133, verse 1. Amen? How good is blessing it is when God's people live together in unity. We all, we all are together in the church, members of the church. We are the body of the church. We all are important. And the peace that God brings through the Holy Spirit is in this place now. And the joy also. And I hope you are feeling that. And, and the Lord is with us. Amen? When we are in the presence of God, everything is possible. The favor of God is in the past, and we are invincible. We can do anything that favor in our lives. Amen? Do you believe that? Amen. Uh, Pastor Ray was mentioning about next week, so don't forget to, to we are going to celebrate uh, our mission Sunday. So the message is going to be pointing in that direction. Also, we we are going to have a special time praying for the team that is going to, to visit one, once again Africa, Malawi. And God is going to allow us to, to, to reach that place as a church. And He's going to also do great things over there. Amen? Thank you for that. So, it's still time to, to keep contributing to the missions. If it's something that you can do it, if it's in your heart, don't forget to, to write in an envelope and contribute uh, economically to that trip. Um, I pick up one of the papers that is on the table that speak a little bit about what's the Malawi Initiative. And it says that, it says that the Malawi Initiative exist, exists through bringing faith, hope, and love. And love. Love initiative to the one part of Africa. Through these initiatives, we are able to reach the people of Malawi in all ways, socially, socially physically, physically, and spiritually. So that's the job that God is doing through over there in Malawi through our church. Amen? Amen. Amen. Um, I think we are going to collect now tithes and offerings. If you have your tithe and offering, I will invite you to take it now. And I want to read another Bible verse that speaks about it says the Psalms 34, verse 8. It says, The Lord is talking to us. It says, Test and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the, is the man who takes refuge in him. Amen. God is telling us, test me, and you will see that I will be the one who provides for all needs. And the one who is going to bless your life all the time. Amen? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for this great opportunity that we have to honor you with our tithes and offerings, Lord. Father, and still multiply, make it rich for all the needs that the church has. And also to keep expanding the gospel of your love. Not only in America, but also around the world. Thank you, Lord. Receive it in the name of Jesus. Thank you. Now, if you are ready, I would like you to, to don't allow any distraction at this time because uh, I'm sure that once again our God is going to use our pastor to deliver a powerful message that is going to help us to keep growing in faith. Amen? Amen. Be ready for that. Praise the Lord this morning. Amen. God is so good. If you have your Bibles, if you should have your Bibles, turn with me, if you will, to 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 19. As we close our series this morning on lessons from a narcissist. Lessons from a narcissist. It's been interesting seeing... Uh, where Saul, King Saul, was headed and uh, what lessons we learned from his life when, uh, when you desire to exalt yourself, when you desire to put yourself forward. Now, it's so interesting, you know, maybe you're not like this picture. 
Uh, if you've ever taken a selfie, maybe you are like that moment. No, but uh, uh, we live in a culture that's so focused on self, that's so focused on uh, pleasing self at any cost, okay? That's really the heart of narcissism is putting yourself forward all the time. And maybe we've, we've come across that. Maybe we've struggled that. And, and uh, I want to see this morning the outcome of narcissism, uh, the outcome of putting yourself forward. And I've titled this one, Inviting the Wrong Presence, okay? Inviting the wrong presence. Have you ever invited somebody that uh, has come to your house and then after a few minutes you realize why did I invite them? <laughs> yeah, <I don't> know. <laughs> many of you. Don't, I hope you haven't said that about me. I know uh, just you, but, but many of you probably done that. I know it's happened to me before, you know, inviting somebody to your house and then after have you invited somebody to your house and you had a great time and then realize can't get rid of them. <laughs> Well, how do you get them to go? You know, well, the kids are in bed now. Okay, uh, time to go. No, but we've all had those uh, experiences. Let me tell you, that happens spiritually. And so let's see what happens. First Samuel chapter 19, picking up at verse 9, as we continue in the story, King Saul wants to kill David. Uh, he doesn't want him there. And I don't know if you remember last week, uh, King Saul's greatest motive, the, the, the greatest uh, method he had to destroy David was, do you remember what he did? He, he married, him off, married him off to his daughter. <laughs> How do you destroy somebody? Hook him up with your daughter. And so that's what he, that was his plan, and so this is where we pick up, all right? 1 Samuel chapter 19, 7, verse 9. Now there was an evil spirit from the Lord on Saul as he was sitting in his house with his spear in his hand, and David was playing the harp with his hand. Saul tried to pin David to the wall with the spear, but he slipped away out of Saul's presence so that he stuck the spear into the wall, and David fled and escaped that night. Then Saul sent messengers to David's house to watch him in order to put him to death in the morning. But Michal, David's wife, told him, saying, If you do not save your life tonight, tomorrow you will be put to death. So Michal led David down through a window, and he went out and fled, and he escaped. And Michal took the household idol and laid it on, on the bed, put a quilt of goat's hair at, as its head, and covered it with clothes. When Saul sent messengers to take David, she said, He's sick. Then Saul sent messengers to see David, saying, Bring him up to me. Up, uh, bring him up to me on his bed, that I may put him to death. When the messengers entered, behold, the household idol was on the bed with the quilt of goat's hair at its head. So Saul said to Micah, "Why have you deceived me like this and let my enemy go, so that he escaped?" And Micah said to Saul, "He said to me, Let me go. Why should I put you to death?" So David fled and escaped and came to Samuel at Ramah. And he told him that all that Saul had done to him, and he and Samuel went and stayed at Naioth. And it was told Saul, saying, Behold, David is at Naioth in Ramah. So Saul sent messengers to David, but when they saw the company of prophets prophesying, with Samuel standing and presiding over them, the Spirit of God came upon the messengers of Saul, and they also prophesied. When it was told Saul, he sent other messengers, and they also prophesied. So Saul sent messengers again the third time, and they also prophesied. Then he himself went to Ramah, and they came as far as a large well that is in Seku. And he asked and said, Where are Samuel and David? And someone said, Behold, they are at Nioth and Ramah. And he proceeded there to Nioth and Ramah, and the Spirit of God came upon him also, so that he went along prophesying continually until he came to Nioth and Ramah. And he also stripped off his clothes, and he too prophesied before Samuel, and laid down naked all that day and that night. Therefore they say, uh, therefore they say, is Saul also among the prophets? All right. The Lord would bless his word this morning. What an encounter. What a story that happened there. There's a lot of pieces there that are tricky to work through, and hopefully we can work through them together and shed some light on um, what this means and what the, this was saying. What an experience that Saul was having here. Imagine Saul was sitting in his house and uh, uh, out of all the people uh, in the world that he hated, instead of hating the enemies of God, Saul hated his closest ally, he hated David. 
Now, how ironic was it that not only did he hate David, but David was the only person in the kingdom that could calm Paul's, uh, calm Saul's anxiety by playing the harp. By playing the harp. So David was in there. there uh, he was playing music, calming, uh, calming King Saul. And it says, you imagine sitting there playing for the king, and the king throws a spear at you. Throw a spear at him. Miss him. Just miss him. It hits the wall and David runs out of there. And you know what's so interesting? The Bible is so clear in uh, how this happened. You know this happened about two or three times. Two or three times. I don't know about you, but if, if somebody threw a spear at me, number one, the first time, I would not visit that house any longer. You know, uh, Imagine going to visit somebody for tea and then you find out they tried to lace the tea and poison you. Would you go back? No, probably not. That's why I haven't visited somebody's house anymore. You know, but uh, they tried to kill him and they haven't gone back there. And so, but David goes back and he is serving King Saul. Look at that quote on your page. At its core, narcissism is the work of an evil spirit. It reflects and mimics the mission of the one from whom it came, the devil. It mimics the, the spirit of the one who, who went before him. That's the devil. Turn with me, if you will, to Isaiah 14, uh, chapter, uh, Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 to 15. It gives us kind of a, the description. This is, uh, chronologically speaking, this is before um, creation. What happened here? This is a story of the devil. Uh, the writer says, How you have fallen from heaven, O star of the morning, son of the dawn. You have been cut down to the earth, you who have weakened the nations. But you said in your hearts, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God, and I will sit on the mount of the assembly in the recesses of the north. Go one more verse here. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, and I will make myself like the most high. Wow. Can you imagine that? Uh, a created being such as the devil uh, making those claims before God that he would be lifted higher. Let me tell you, that, that uh, desire to put yourself in front of everything else is the spirit of narcissism that we see here. So we see, let me tell you, in, in this world, and even in the struggles that we face, when we face that advancing ourselves before anyone else, that's not just a character flaw. That's not just a difficulty that we have processing through. It is a spirit that is there to torment you and to gain access into your life, okay? Let's look at how it came into Saul's life. We'll start, oh, how it ended in Saul's life. Number one on your page. Saul's narcissism opened the door for demonic activity. Okay? Saul's narcissism opened the door for demonic activity. You know, a lot of uh, people don't talk about spiritism much. People don't talk about that today. They don't talk about uh, uh, struggling spiritually. You know what I find? I find when I visit other countries, and in particular when we're in Africa, spiritualism is so open all the time. You know, uh, people are, are open to, to spiritualism, not just uh, Christianity or the Holy Spirit, but they're open to their ancestral spirits. Like those of you that have come from other countries, usually it's like that as well. You know, uh, worship of ancestors, uh, they're attuned, their uh, spiritism is commonplace, okay? So when they finally meet God, when they finally receive Christ and invite Him into their life, there is always that realization of spiritualism is not something, it is not a foreign concept. They readily accept God's presence because they are used to spirit. It's only here in the United States, and if we can say it in this kind of a way, civilized cultures in which spirit, uh, spirit, uh, spiritism, spirituality, all things that have to do with the spiritual world are actually hidden under other things. They're hidden under disorders. They're hidden under the name of, of uh, uh, psychological issues or, or chemical imbalances. You know, I never uh, forget this one experience. I was driving a van with one pastor in Malawi, and he was uh, taking a course, and the course was an American course, and uh, unfortunately, he was taking American psychology. And we were sitting, and he said, that's the worst class that I'm taking. I said, why, why is it so bad? He said, it doesn't make sense. None of it makes sense. And I'm not downing psychology, but he said, none of these uh, classes make sense. I said, tell me about your course. 
He said, it's talking about all these issues that people have. It's talking about their mental state. It's talking about these imbalances that they have. And I said, well, what, what, what uh, information does he give you? He says, it tells us how we ought to sit with them for hours and how it takes weeks and sometimes years to correct these issues that have been in their life for years. And he says, it's not right. It's not right. He says, that's not how we deal with it in Africa. And I said, how do you deal with it in Africa? He says, we rebuke the spirit, it leaves, and then they are made whole. You know, I sat there for a moment. Now, again, there are issues in people's lives that are deep-rooted, and there are issues that people need to work through. There are character problems, that are chemical imbalances, but there are also spirits. There are also struggles, things from the spiritual world that attack people. And I sat there in that van listening, and I watched them as they prayed for people and as they called out spirits in people's lives that had been tormenting them and how those spirits left. And I realized, wow, a lot of these things are sent from the enemy of our soul. And what we do is we talk around them instead of dealing with the heart of the matter. Dealing with the heart of the matter. Look at verse 9 with me for a moment. Look what that says. I want you to see that clearly for a moment. Verse 9. Now there was an evil spirit from the Lord on Saul. Now, that's a very debated verse, and I want to bring clar clarification for you in a moment. If, for those of you that say the Lord brings good things and bad things to people, that is just not the case. God is not the author of evil. God is not uh, the author of sin. So sin does not come from God. Hardship does not come from God. Evil spirits do not come from God. But you may look at this and say, but what does that mean? Now there was an evil spirit from the Lord, from the Lord. It is important to note that the evil spirit was not from God. The evil spirit was from the Lord in that it was allowed by God to harass Saul. I want you to write that word allowed in on your page there. And you, you see and understand that. The evil spirit was from the Lord in that it was allowed by God. That's what the meaning is there. That spirit was allowed by God to torment Saul, which is such an awesome uh, thought uh, process there, is that evil spirits may come to torment you, may come to attack your life, but nothing in this world happens without our God knowing, without God being over it. Why does God allow it? That's the question. Why does God allow it? A lot of times God may allow it to strengthen us. You know, if you look at, uh, remember Job? Remember his story? The devil went before God and said, Oh, Job is only serving you because you bless his life. But take away your blessings and see what happens. And God allowed that spirit to torment Job. And Job came through. In this case, God allowing that spirit to torment Saul was actually for judgment. Saul had been in great sin. And he was uh, uh, not only... Uh, hurting the people of Israel, but he was taking away from them a relationship with God. So God allowed that spirit to harass Saul. Now look what happened. So verse 9, there was an evil spirit from the Lord on Saul as he was sitting in his house with his spear in his hand, and David was playing the harp. Even before you get to verse 10, you know that's a, a recipe for disaster. You take somebody struggling, you give them a little bit of anger, and things go wrong. Have you ever done anything stupid out of anger? Have you ever broken something that you wish you didn't break out of anger? I know no one will answer that one. I'll answer it for us collectively because I know you're sitting there saying, I don't want to be the one to say I've broken something that's important. Maybe that's interesting. Yes. Probably. I remember years ago, very many years ago, I was struck. I, I, it was something from my teenage years that I had to work through, struggling with anger, really struggling with anger. And I remember uh, holding a phone in my hand, not a cell phone since before. Can you believe that I can say I'm old enough to remember when there were cell phones? And all of you can probably say, hey, man, you know, uh, some of the young girls in here are like, oh, yeah, so uh, uh, I think it was me uh, a few weeks ago, or whatever it was, we were trying to describe what a payphone was. You know, <laughs> remember, remember that? And so, 
But I, I remember holding a handset, you know those nice ones with the really long antenna that you have to pull out, you know, seven feet. And I was holding one of those, I remember in my hand you're taking it, throwing it into the wall, and it breaking into pieces, and the only minutes later realizing, why did I do that? I need that phone, you know? <laughs> I need that phone. So anger brings about this destruction in our lives that causes us to do things that we probably regret. Maybe instead of breaking something, have you ever said something in anger that you wish you hadn't said? Of course. Done something to someone, said something to them, and you're like, why? Why did I do that? Why did I say that? Well, when you're younger, when you're older. When you're, when you're, when you're older, it doesn't happen, right? Those who, when you're older, it doesn't happen. But maybe you've done that, right? You said something, and then tried to uh, uh, work it by. Have you ever said something, and then, then said to the person, I, I didn't mean that? Well, that doesn't help, does it? Saul's narcissism opened the door for demonic activity. Look at that paragraph there. Saul's narcissism, coupled with anger, was an open invite for evil spirits to wreak havoc over his life. His narcissism, along with anger, okay? Anger. Now, I want to tell you, narcissism, the spirit of narcissism, comes with friends. Comes with friends. It's like the Mormons coming to your house. They don't come by themselves. They come with someone else. You know, they never come alone. This spirit doesn't come at you. It doesn't come to attack you by itself. It brings with itself a spirit of anger. And let me tell you, anger in our life is not just something we struggle with. Anger is a spirit. I'll tell you why anger is a spirit. Turn with me, if you will, to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 26 and 27. Ephesians 4, 26. Okay, look what it says here. Be angry and do not sin. Now, he's not just saying you can, you're, I, I like when people interpret this when they say you're allowed to be angry. That's not what the Bible is saying. You can be angry, but don't sin and you're angry. You know, there's things that we could be righteous against, things that we could have, if I, if I can use this word, I don't like using it in this way, but when people say holy anger, you ought to be angry at sin. You ought to have that disgust towards sin, have that disgust towards towards uh, uh, things that are against God in this world. But not you, you ought not to just have a spirit of anger, all right? You, you can't just be angry and say, oh, I, I'm angry and I want to kill you, but I didn't kill you because that would be sin. So I can just stay angry and just not kill you. That, no, we ought not to have anger. We ought not to have anger. So it says, be angry, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down your anger. Let's go to the next verse. Let's go to the telling verse, verse 27. And do not give the devil an opportunity. Do not give him an opportunity. Other translations uh, translate the word opportunity as foothold or strong. Do not give him a foothold. That spirit comes into your life looking to gain access into your life. Looking to gain access. The moment you allow it in, it has a foothold. It has a foothold. The spirit that wants attention, wants to grab onto your life. Saul's narcissism opened the door for demonic activity, it came with anger, and then all of a sudden, he opened that door for spiritual difficulty, and it just consumed him. It consumed him. Consumed his life. Consumed the, the uh, direction of his life. And let me tell you, if you read the rest of the story, which I wish you would, is go on and read what happened in King Saul's life, and he died miserably. He died miserably. Sad life. Let's look at number two. This one is interesting to me. Number two. Saul's narcissism brought family tension and multiplied family sin. Saul's narcissism brought family tension and multiplied family sin. Let's look at these few verses, 11 through 17. So I like how the story picks up. Saul tried to pin David to the wall. Why did David go back all the time? This actually helped me. It has to change my life as well. It's teasing this way. But uh, when you're, when King Saul's your in-laws, you have to visit them even if they try to kill you, right? So there he is. Saul was trying. Saul was trying. He was going there because King Saul is his father. King Saul tries to kill him. He goes back home and his wife, now, actually, this was, remember the story? This was the second one that wanted David. This was not his first one, the, the first one that he should have married. Remember that last week? King Saul promised his firstborn, and David, on the wedding day, 
Saul takes another man and gives it to her. This is Saul's second daughter, says, I want to marry David. And he says, yes, she will be a snare to him and lets her marry him. So David goes home and he tells his wife, and I like this, Michal, David's wife said to him, if you do not save your life tonight, tomorrow you will be put to death. Does she love him? Mm -hmm. I would say yes. Yeah. She loves him. She wants his life spared. So Michal let David down through a window and he went out and he fled in his field. What a good wife. She took the household idol, she covered it with a goat's hair, put it on the bed, and Saul sent messengers there to take David. She said, he's sick. And the story goes on. They said, I don't care if he's sick, bring him up with the whole bed. I want him dead. Verse 17, Saul comes to Michal and says, why have you deceived me like this and let my enemy go? And she said, he threatened me. Look at the bruises here. He was going to hit me. He threatened me that he would kill me. Now, Saul's narcissism brought family tension and multiplied families. Well, would you agree with me that there was tension in that family? Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, some problems in that family. Now, I would even go more to say not just tension, there was severe problems in that family. Lying had developed from the king and was passed down to his children. Lying was developed from the king. The king, through his narcissism, through his anger, he developed the spirit of lying. Do you remember last week we talked about it? When he said to, to David, he said, you do as I asked you. All I want you to do is to serve me and to serve God. He was lying. He wanted to kill David. He wanted to destroy him. And let me tell you, that lying from that parent made its way into the heart of his, their children. We're going to see this uh, thread through a lot of King Saul's children. And I find it interesting here. She loved David. Let David escape. Wouldn't you think she would say to her father, why did you let David go? And she would say to him, because I love him. Why would you let him go? Because he's my husband. <laughs> why would you let him go? Um, I have children with him. Why did you let him go? Because he tried to kill me. Now, you tell a man that wants to kill David that he tried to kill your daughter, what does that do even more? He needs to die. He needs to die. I think that's so interesting there. That heart, that spirit, that problem in Saul's life passed on to his children. Now, this is a really interesting one here, too. Jumbled priorities and strongholds passed from the king to his children. Household titles became commonplace. Look at verse 13. Don't miss this one verse here. So many people work over it. Michal took the household idol. Why would she have a household idol? Now, the, the, the Hebrew word for that household idol is the word tadafim, and it describes a full figured idol. It's not a little trinket that she had somewhere. This was a carved out idol, and we know that it was big enough to resemble David because she stuck it in the bed, covered the top of it with goat's hair, and put a blanket on it. Put his clothes on it, put a blanket. So it's a full size uh, um, uh, idol. And I like that the word used for idol means this an object of reverence and a means for divination. A means for divination. They were called the psychic ne network with this idol. It was their way of worship. Now, isn't that interesting? David, now we see, once David gets free from this woman and free from King Saul, a lot of things start to change in his life. But Saul's issues brought them so far that he would bring idol worship into his family. A nation that served God, there was idol worship there. Idol worship. So she took the idol, put it on the bed. That's disturbing, isn't it? Even though she, it's a verse meant to hide David, it was one. There shouldn't have been an idol in that home. There shouldn't have been that. Let me tell you, in our lives, if we don't correct the issues of putting ourselves first, we allow idols to come into our life. We'll allow idols to come into our home, to come into our children's lives, and to come into those who are connected to us. It all comes out from our lives. So that's what his narcissism did. It brought family tension and multiplied family. Let's look at this third one here together. 
This one is the coolest one here, and we'll explain these few verses. Saul's narcissism was continually confronted by the Spirit of God. Saul's narcissism was continually confronted by the Spirit of God. So many opposers of God, so many people that are against God will say, Oh, look at verse 9. God sent him a spirit to destroy his life because God wants to hurt people rather than heal them, rather than deliver them. Let me tell you, even though God allowed a spirit to, to uh, attack Saul's life, God provided opportunity after opportunity for Saul to experience God in his own presence so that Saul could not escape God. Saul's narcissism was continually confronted by the Spirit of God. So here it is. David runs, right? David runs and he meets Samuel. Remember who Samuel is? Prophet. The prophet. He's the prophet in the land. Samuel had anointed King Saul, and Samuel had also anointed David to be king over Saul. And so he runs to Samuel and he tells him everything that's going on, and Samuel says, don't worry about it. Saul finds out where he is and sends messengers, go there and I want you to kill David. And it says that as the messengers came, there's Samuel, there's David, there are all the prophets the, with them there. And as the messengers came, the prophets started praying. When you see the word they're prophesying, people say, what does that mean they were prophesying? They were worshiping God. They were declaring God's presence. And this is the Old Testament when God would selectively put his presence on people. We live in the New Testament era, okay? Jesus died, came back to life, and now his spirit lives inside of us. God's spirit lives with each one of us and accept him as Lord. But in the Old Testament, God would selectively put his spirit on someone for a season, for a time. So here he was. God had put his spirit, his presence on those prophets. And there, the prophets are worshiping God. God's presence is there in that group. Okay? They can sense God's presence, feel his presence there. And it says that the first messengers went, and as they confronted these prophets, they could not help but encounter God. They encountered God's presence. And it says they too started prophesying. What were they saying? They too started worshiping God. There was no excuse. They were caught in it. God's presence was there. I like the word gets out back to Saul. Your first group of messengers are in church. So Saul sends a second group. And says, well, get them out. Go take them out. And the second group gets there, and they start worshiping together. Saul hears about it, and he sends a third set. You know, I think, he, I think each set that he sent were probably not messengers. He probably sent the good guys first. Then he sent the somewhat bad ones. And then now he's sending the, the really bad ones. You know, you go there and, you know, throw a bomb in there. Do something, but destroy them. I'll bring them out. The third set goes and they encounter God's presence and they start worshiping. And it says that Saul himself went down. Now this is so crucial. I like this. Saul went down there himself. Verse 23, he proceeded to Nath and Ramah. And the Spirit of God came upon him also. He was overcome by the presence of God. That is so important for us in the fact of in the fact that it's this is that God will always come after us. I like that. His grace is us. God will come after us. God caused there to be situations where Saul would come in contact with the Spirit. Fill in this blank here. God's grace is relentless. God's grace is relentless. God allowed Saul to encounter him over and over and over so that Saul would finally get to the place and say, I give up. God, I give up. I turn to you. So look at this. He comes there. The Spirit of God comes down on him, falls on him. So that he went along prophesying continually until he came to Nath and Ramah. And he goes on to say, verse 24, he also stripped off his clothes. Now, what in the world does that mean? Why did Saul strip down? Why did he get naked? It doesn't refer that he stripped himself and made a fool of himself. You know, that was a sign in the time when you had given yourself to God, when you would give your life to God, especially in mourning, when you would grieve sins in your life, it says that the prophets would strip themselves, take their clothes off, say, God, I am completely bare before you. And that's what Saul did. He got into the presence. He was overcome. The feelings, 
of, of going after God were there. And I like this for a moment, is that he had an experience with God. And we clearly see that he had an experience with God. But we know from the end of the story is that he did not allow God's presence to continue in his life. And that is the danger with many of us. Is that we experience God. We have an experience and then we go back to the grind of our life. And let me tell you, when we experience God, when we have this experience with him, his presence is here. Let me tell you, spirits that may be trying to attack your life will go. Spirits will be out, out away from your life. But let me tell you, when you get back into your routine of your life, they're there waiting for you. And you must determine at that point, no, they will no longer come into my life. No longer have stronghold into my life. No longer have stronghold into my life. God's grace is relentless. So there they were. They were praying. Uh, Saul was praying there as well. God's grace is relentless. He will continually come after you. There is always opportunity to turn one's focus and attention on God. There's always opportunity. Saul was completely without excuse. He could never stand before God and say, you didn't give me a chance. God gave me chance after chance after chance. Now, how do we put it into practice? And this is what I want to focus on. One portion of scripture as we break, closing this by breaking the spirit of narcissism. Okay, turn with me, if you will, to James chapter 4. How do we break this spirit? How do we kick it out? Well, there's things that we ought to do. You know, I, I, I said it as we started, if you've ever invited somebody into your home and you couldn't get rid of them, there's things that you could do to get rid of them, right? Uh, we've all tried them. I hope, well, maybe you have. Maybe you guys are like so, you are probably all really righteous and I'm really uh, in sin. But I tried these things, you know? <laughs> you have tried looking at my watch in front of them. Oh, come on, can you believe it already? It's already that time, and, and, uh, and, and then you'll find that they'll, they'll agree with you, and they'll say, wow, I can't believe it, so much time. So, you know. And then uh, you try to uh, find excuses, but then you end up resorting to lying. Well, maybe you shouldn't lie. Well, I have an appointment, actually, I have to be at. But there's a, a process that you go through. While our natural process always fails, God's spiritual process for kicking out an unwanted guest will work. I want to show us how to break the spirit of narcissism, really, if I could redeem that, how to kick it out, okay? James chapter 4, verse 7 through 10, okay? James 4, verse 7 through 10. These are powerful verses. I'll read them all, and then we'll go through them. Submit, therefore, to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. Draw near to God, he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be miserable, <laughs> And mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord and He will exalt you. Now, how to bring the Spirit. Number one in your page. Submit to God and allow Him to guide your actions. Submit to God. Look at verse 7 there. Submit therefore to God. Submit to God. What does that mean, submit to God? People don't understand. What does that mean, submit to God? It means yield to Him. Yield to Him. To say to Him, God, you, not only, not just a lip service that we can do. God, I worship you. God, I'm a Christian. God, I believe that you died for me. But submitted to Him is saying, God, I give you the right of my life. Better yet, let's change it different, different words. I give you the right to my feelings. I give you the right to my emotions. How many of you keep your emotions to yourself? I know why I probably do. We struggle with that, don't we? But God, I give you the right to those things. As we give those to God, look what that verse says. Submit yourself to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. How do you break that narcissistic spirit? You submit to God, then you stand firm and say, all right, my life now belongs to Him, and that spirit goes. It cannot stay there. It cannot last. It cannot endure. Submit to God, and the devil will flee. 
It starts with that submission to God. Submit to Him. Allow Him to guide your actions. Number two, spend time with God as first priority. Now, we're always back to this point, right? In everything we do, sometimes it feels like it gets monotonous, but spending time with God is actually the thing that changes our life. Spending time with God. Look at verse 8. Draw near to God, and He will draw near to you. I love that condition there. Now, is God everywhere? Yes. Yeah. So do, do we have to draw God's presence in? No. His presence is there. Then why does it give this kind of uh, phraseology here? Draw near to God, and He will draw near to you. It means that as you submit to God, as you spend time to God, you allow God's presence, which is already there, to have effect over your life. That's what it is. So that God can have effect in our life. Oh, I don't see God doing anything. Well, probably not spending any time with Him. You spend time with Him, you allow His Spirit to have effect over your life. Draw near to God, He will draw near to you. Look at this. Spend time with God is the first priority. I like that it says the rest of this word, these words here. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. He's talking about sin, but what he's talking about is priority. Why do they have to cleanse their hands? Why are they double-minded? Because there's so many things that they are putting before relationship with God. Let me tell you, there's so many things in our life that we could probably mark down on our page and say, yeah, there are things that are before, that are before God. There are things that I do, things that I say, there are actually experiences. Maybe we become lazy, slothful. Maybe we become uh, uh, lazy in our time, even spending time with God. And here he says, draw near to God. Let that be your priority, and he will draw near to you. Okay, so submit to God, the devil runs. Spend time with God, and God is there in your life. Number three, this is so cool. Regain sensitivity to sin. Regain sensitivity to sin. Look at verse 9. Don't misinterpret this. Be miserable and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to gloom. Isn't that the greatest? Don't you, don't you want that in your life? No. We look at that and say, oh, that's what God wants from my life? God wants me to be miserable? No, don't, don't, uh, don't, don't, <laughs> don't convert this wrongly. He's talking about the previous verse that we read, talking about your sin. It says, be miserable when it comes to thinking about your sin. When you look at the difficulties, the sins in your life, you ought to be miserable about that and say, I don't want it in my life any longer. I don't want this hardship in my life any longer. I don't want the sin to stay in my life. Regain sensitivity. Let me tell you, so many of us have been desensitized to sin. So many of us have been desensitized to sin. Come on, think of it even in, in movies that we may watch coming from years ago, you know? Uh, I remember uh, one of the first movies I remember as a young kid, uh, was E.T. You remember E.T.? <laughs> remember E.T.? Oh, I remember E.T. And, uh, and uh, uh, even TV shows that I used to watch, Land of the Lost. I don't know if you remember Land of the Lost. Uh, some of those old ones. But uh, I remember E.T. was rated PG-13. And uh, uh, you, hopefully you didn't watch any R-rated movies. But take an R-rated movie from 1980 and put it together with a PG movie from 2017 and see the comparison there. We have been desensitized. What was considered PG in 1980 would be considered, you know, uh, would be a G in the movie today. We become desensitized, right? We become desensitized. Now, I was thinking about this. It's been a few weeks. We went down to Florida. Um, I didn't have to play my guitar as much. Uh, I didn't play my guitar at all. And those of you that, if you've ever played guitar or something like that, when you play the strings, your fingers ache really bad. So I remember when I first started playing the guitar, oh, my, my fingers would split and even bleed. And I remember wanting to not play the guitar anymore because of that. And, 
uh, I would go to the music store and they'd say, no, you gotta keep doing it. I'm like, am I doing something wrong? You know, am I not holding, pressing the strings right? They would say, no, no, your fingers have to develop callus, uh, calluses. And he said, eventually they'll scab. He said that callus will continually fall off. It'll get really hard, it'll fall off, and your fingers will get to the point where they become completely numb. And that happened to me. The more I played the guitar, my fingers became really callous to the point where not only were my fingertips hard, but I lost feeling in them where I would touch things and couldn't feel it in my fingertips. And that's normal in that kind of a way. Now, I don't play the guitar as much. I play it Sunday mornings. I don't really play much uh, during the uh, week. But when I went out to Florida, I went two weeks, uh, just about two weeks without playing. And I came back, and last week when I picked up my guitar, oh my goodness, I could, sometimes if you watch me during worship, well, don't watch me, don't pay attention to God, but I have to like shake my hand, and I, <laughs> I can't feel my fingers, I'm like, oh my gosh, because of the pain, it hurts so bad that I don't have calluses on my fingers anymore. And even today, I was playing, I said, God, please let the calluses just come for one second, just so I can get through these songs. The calluses block all the feelings, but as I spent time away from the guitar, my feelings started coming back, and now I feel lots of things, and the, the stuff is there. Let me tell you, so many of us have become so callous to sin, right? There are things that were sin that we would avoid, but then we allow them. It's just a small thing, and all of a sudden you realize that it no longer bothers you. No longer bothers you, you can go a little further into sin, and that will no longer bother you, and then you can go deeper into sin and realize that has no effect on me because we become callous to it. That verse, James 4 9, God says, start to hate sin in your life. And what happens? Why does God ask us to do this? See, these spirits that were sent to Saul, they were there and they started building calluses. It starts with hatred. It starts with a little uh, attempt here. And all of a sudden, he throws a spear at David. Now, hopefully none of you have ever attempted to kill him. But think of that problem. He threw a spear and almost speared his son-in-law to the wall. And it was no big deal. To the point where he was hunting him down like a dog. David says it. He he says to King David, you are hunting, he says to King Saul, you are hunting me like a dog when he was hiding in the cage that we were getting. He got so far, King Saul became so calloused. How do you break the sin callous? Submit to God, spend time with God, hate sin, and all of a sudden you regain sensitivity. And you realize, you'll start walking places and realizing, okay, God, I can feel your presence now. I can feel what you're telling me to do, what you're telling me to, to be. Regain sensitivity. Regain sensitivity. Two, real fast. Number four. Desire humility, practice humility. Look at verse 10, first part of verse 10. Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord. Humble yourself. Desire humility and practice humility. Practice sacrificing yourself. Practice sacrificing yourself. Practice sacrificing yourself. What can you give from your life? Practice that. Giving from your life. Being uh, uh, self-sacrificial. Sacrificing from your heart, your life, your abilities, your gift. Sacrifice. Desire humility, practice humility. Last one, number five. Look to God only for promotion. Last part of verse 10. It says, humble yourself in the presence of God, and He will exalt you. Thank you. I want to say that for a moment. God knows what you're going through. He knows what I'm going through. God knows what you need. He knows how you feel. He knows exactly how to promote you at work. He knows how to promote you at home. He knows how to promote you in marriage. He knows how to promote you with your children. God knows how to promote you. You know why I become so frustrated when we don't get promotion? It's because we're not submitting to God. We're not spending time with God. We're not grieving about our sin. and We're not looking to God to advance us. He says here, humble yourself, submit to God, 
Humble yourself in the presence of the Lord, and he will exalt you. Look to God for your promotion. God will promote us. God will exalt us. God will lead us. Let me tell you, this spirit of narcissism, I know it's a big word that we've been working through this month, narcissism, narcissism, this spirit that wants to put itself first ought to break in our lives. And we ought to allow God to do something powerful in and through us. Amen. Amen. That God would lead us to God. Praise God. Praise God. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. I'm going to ask you, would you stand this morning as we ask God to change the direction in our life? Okay? I'm anticipating. Listen, God met us already today. We've had a touch from Him. He's met us, and even as we we're praying, then into worship, and now into the Word. We've taken the deposit of the Word. Now let's say to Him, God, let it make manifest in my life. Let it grow inside of me so that I can give my life to you. All right, let's do that today. Lord, we thank you this morning for your touch. Thank you, God, that you met us, that you touched our lives, our minds, our bodies. And God, even as we've taken in your word this morning, we ask you, Lord, God, maybe we haven't submitted to you. Maybe we haven't spent time with you. God, it's these consistent things. It's these things that... Lord, are simple, that we even can say, I know that's what I ought to do, but yet we just don't do it. We stay away from you. And Lord, we ask you, forgive us. Lord, together we say, if there be any spirit of narcissism, of anger, of bitterness that may be resting over us, any spirit of depression, Lord, we call it out. In the name of Jesus, today, we resist you. We resist you today. We declare you have no place in my life. You have no place in my life. Lord, I ask you by your power this morning, Jesus, that you would meet us. Bring change into our life. Bring change into our life. Help us, God. Help us to live a life of giving. So we can break this spirit that wants to put itself first. Lord, we trust you. We thank you for all that you do. Lord, I ask you this morning that you would bless each one of us. Bless us. Let your favor be on us, God. That you would cause us to be advancing in all ways. Even this week, God. That we would look back on the week and say, God, we have experienced your goodness and your favor. Bless your church. I speak a word of blessing over this church. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 God bless you this morning. I will encourage some.